Please stand if you're able for the reading of God's Word. We will read today from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 through 18. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us, to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves, as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may, greatly, may be greatly enlarged. So that we may preach the gospel in the lands beyond you, without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. May God bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. Wow, pretty great song at the end there from the music team. Um, Busy time of year. A lot of people are busy getting kids back into school, getting kids off to college. It's no accident that Labor Day falls in this period of time. Of course, every Sunday is Labor Day in the sense that it's a rest from labor. It's supposed to be. We've kind of forgotten that. Um, So, look, we're looking at this scripture as we go through 2 Corinthians. There's a lot of juice in the scripture we're looking at today. It's like a ripe orange that's just bursting with flavor. Paul is very serious here, but he also leads with a bit of sarcasm. I don't know if we can get verse 12 up again. We covered it last week. Paul leads with a bit of sarcasm and, but he moves quickly from there to set the record straight. Sometimes when there's been an affront, you need to set the record straight, right? I mean, we, we, you know, we've kind of got this weird thing going in American politics now. I think it's bizarre, um, where almost on a daily basis, the top people in politics are trying to set the record straight. Um, and it just seems like a big mess all the time. But Paul here is setting the record straight with the church, And he's doing this for the good of the Corinthian church and the kingdom. Just to look at this, for those of you who are a little bit, uh, who who like to think about things in terms of abstraction, let me just say before we begin our sermon formally, read you verse 12. Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure, think about that, when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. This is a statement that dispels relativism 2,000 years ago. If you look at it carefully, relativism is based on people's comparison to others and to themselves. But God is absolute. God is absolute, and therefore God eviscerates relativism and He eviscerates this idea that we're to derive our value and our worth and our morals and things like that by comparisons to others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your help. Thank you that your word reigns supreme. Thank you that Christ reigns supreme. Sitting at the right hand of the Father, forgiving us for our sins, being just to forgive us for our sins when we confess them. Thank you so much for the Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you are worthy, that you are good, that you are great, that you are worthy of praise. And thank you, Lord, that we may serve you and that while we are not worthy of praise as you are, that that we are your children and your people and that you teach us to love one another. Thank you for all these things, Lord. Help us to learn today. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we've got three points today. Thank you for putting that up, media team. We've got three points today. Point one, reaching outwards. That's verses 13 and 14 of 10. 
I just, you know, we're, we're starting with 13, not 12, you know, which we covered last week. Uh, point two, reaching inwards to reach outwards. Verse 15 and 16 verses. And point three, reaching upwards. That's verses 17 and 18. And our title, and it may surprise some of you a bit, Proper Limits in Ministry. Proper Limits in Ministry. All through our text today, you see that ministry has proper limits. Point one now, reaching outwards. Will you read verses 12 and, or 13 and 14 with me? Thank you. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard, you might want to underline here, only with regard to the area of influence, the area of influence God assigned to us, or God has assigned to us, God assigned to us, to reach even to you, says Paul. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. Paul moves from man doing what man wants to do. Think about what I'm saying. Paul moves from man doing what man wants to do to man doing what God assigns him. Now, how many of you have ever held a job? Okay. And how many of you at that job have had a boss? Okay, most of you, right? First jobs always come with a boss. If you're very successful, maybe, maybe you'll become the boss or, or something like that, if you want to say it that way. Maybe that's not uh, politically correct these days to call somebody the boss. You know, but when I was 15 and a half in the 80s and I started working, you called the boss the boss and you did what he said. But in any case, that all being the case, right, right, Paul makes clear that we do what God says, just like at work you do what the boss says. You don't do whatever you want, right? So you don't do what, in ministry, you don't do what you want to do, and you don't have the role that you want, in a, in a sense, but, but with regard to the area of influence God assigned to you, as you see in verse 13, and to Paul. Man doing what God assigns him. Now, now we need to stop and think for just a minute, if you'll think with me. Uh, we live in a free market society. Does that term resonate with anybody? Free market society. In our society, if you can run a business effectively... You can have all the customers, any of the customers that you can get your hands on, right? It's, it's just, it's all out there for the taking. Amazon, no offense, Amazon gets to take everyone now. Doesn't matter if you are a small town, a small business in a small town for 60 years, Amazon gets to take you now. We live in a free market, society. But is this the case with ministry? Is this the case in churches? Is this the case in the kingdom? No, of course not. And our verses today show this. God assigns ministries and churches for people to serve in. Ministries are not part of the free market. Ministries are part of God's will. Churches are not part of the free market. Churches are under God's will. This is a big mistake, especially with non-denominational churches in the United States today. Churches are under God's will, and certain people are to minister in them. Paul was assigned to minister to the Corinthian church, as you can see in verse 13. That's his role. That's his job. God gave it to him. And Paul and his compatriots were the first to reach the Corinthians with the gospel, as you can see in verse 14. 
Paul claims, and it is a scriptural, canonized claim, that God assigned him an area of influence, one which included reaching the Corinthians, the Corinthian church. This is reaching out. This is reaching out, and reaching out is good. It's good if motivated and commissioned by God. Did you hear me? Reaching out is good if motivated and commissioned by God. Reaching out, if it's not of God, is not good. Reaching out is good if it's motivated and commissioned by God, as we see in the Great Commission. In addition to this, what else can we learn from verses 13 and 14, written approximately 2,000 years ago, about people, really, people in another part of the world, people who think differently than Americans do today. In other words, what principles can we learn from verses 13 and 14, which apply to you today in America or to you today in Virginia in 2023? Principle number one that anybody could learn from these two verses. God assigns ministry. God assigns ministry. That's why when somebody says, hey, I want to do this ministry, we ask them, are you called to it? Do you have any sense of internal calling? Number two, we need to concentrate in the area that God has assigned us and not meddle in other people's ministry. Of course, number one, that God assigns ministry, presupposes that ministers can actually discern the area of ministry assigned to them by God, and that the church agrees, affirms, and confirms. After all, and and, uh, pretty much every missionary organization that I've ever seen has totally forgotten this lesson, if they ever knew it. After all, we can see in Acts that Peter and James had a hand in sending Paul out to the missionary field. It was by their sanction. If you want to say it this way, the established church was over the missionary endeavors. We should do ministry, brothers and sisters. I don't want to be a downer. We should do ministry. We should try hard. We should also understand that God assigns roles and areas. Otherwise, there'd be chaos. We shouldn't be boastful, but if we do boast, it should be restricted to our area, not someone else's. So let me give you an example, and this this is a little pretty simple example that you'll see pretty quickly. For example, it's not my job, it's not my job personally, to evangelize or teach every American in the United States. If I thought that was my job, then I would not be surprised if one of you accused me of smoking crack. It's not my job to evangelize or to teach every American Christian in the United States. There are hundreds, literally, brothers and sisters, there are literally hundreds of thousands of preaching pastors in the United States, and it's their job to preach in Los Angeles or New Orleans or wherever. Furthermore, some of these guys on TV are trying to go way beyond their area. I guarantee you. They're trying to go way beyond the area. Even a a, a mid-grade pastor could see that some of these guys have little, very little grasp of theology and are really just more entertainment-focused. They're reaching way beyond. In fact, one network used to call one particular guy, one particular pastor, America's pastor. Remember that? I mean, the, the Cowboys can take on the name America's team, but America's pastor? Give me a break. I've got news for you. America's pastor is Jesus Christ. America's pastor is Jesus Christ. Every other pastor is subsidiary to Jesus. It's not good to call someone America's pastor or Europe's pastor, or Africa's pastor today, unless you are talking about Jesus. Calling someone's Europe's pastor is way, way, way beyond 
the authority and area God has assigned any person today. We're nearly two, brothers and sisters, we're nearly 2,000 years after the founding of the church. Every ministry today is standing on the shoulders of many who came before. There is no America's pastor or Europe's pastor or Africa's pastor today. The church is built on Jesus Christ and the foundation laid by the apostles. They did that kind of work back then. So read verses 13 and 14 with me again. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the influence, the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come all the way to you, all the way in the ancient world. We were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. Ministry is not part of the free market, and we shouldn't try to make ministry conform to the principles of the free market, which is anything goes, and whoever can capture the most people, they're the ones. That, that's, that's a formula for disaster regarding the church. Okay, let's move to point two. This leads us to point two. Reaching inwards to reach outwards. Read verses 15 and 16 with me. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors. It's labor day today. I didn't do this. We've been preaching through 2 Corinthians for how long? 10 months? I didn't plan for today to be on Labor Day. I didn't even know it was going to be Labor Day until like a week ago. We do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's, another person's, in another person's area of influence. This is where the rubber meets the road. We are not to tread, brothers and sisters, we are not to tread on the ministries of others and boast that their work is actually our work. In a sense, Paul's letting some of the false Corinthian leaders know not to try to steal his ministry and pretend that it is their own ministry. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on to tell the Corinthians, if your faith increases and our influence with you grows, we can take the gospel even further out, even beyond Corinth. In other words, the principle here, the church that develops on the inside helps take the gospel to the outside, to places where the gospel has not gone before adequately. This is a pretty uh, easy thing to imagine, right? Pretty easy here to imagine. We're talking about reach, reaching inwards and developing outwards before you take the gospel outwards, right? This is a pretty easy thing to imagine. Imagine you're in a family that's broke all the time. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if your family's broke all the time. But increasingly, under the current politics and economy, I'm pretty sure that many of you are broke a lot of the time because that's the way things are going. Forgive me. But imagine you're in a family that's broke all the time. A family that's broke all the time is not going to travel to a lot of faraway places, right? I mean, if you're broke, you're not flying to Switzerland. If you're broke, you're not flying to Paris for two weeks. If you're broke, you're not flying to Sydney, Australia for some sun in the winter, right? So if you're a family that's broke, you're not going to faraway places, and you're also not going to establish a large charity foundation like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? You've got to be pretty rich to establish these kinds of foundations. 
And if you're broke, you're not going to send out teachers to help people to learn to read. Right? That's not, that's not what broke people do. I include myself. That's not what broke people do because they're concentrating on making a living. Rich families do these things, not broke families. Rich families vacation in the Alps, not broke families. Rich people establish hospitals, not broke families. Does this make sense? I hope it makes sense because an analogy is coming. Our wealth as Christians is not in dollars, but in grace. The dollars don't matter. It's the grace. Rich Christian families, rich Christian families, rich churches, rich Christian families that are rich in God's grace, they take the gospel further and further and further out, even to the ends of the earth, even to places it has never been. With all due respect, it is not the job of denominations to send people out. It is the church's job. As we grow in grace, as we grow on the inside in the church, God's word will go more and more to the outside. Now, uh, if you're like me, you didn't choose to live in the internet age. Did anybody choose to live in the internet age here? Okay. Can I get a show of hands on this? And if you're embarrassed, don't raise your hand. Um, would anybody here choose to live in the Internet age? Is there anybody who will say that? Really? No, I'm serious. I'm not seeing a single hand. I don't believe that. I think there's somebody here who would choose. Okay, there's a few people now, and I'm sure a lot of younger people would choose to live in the Internet age. But I did not choose to live in the Internet age. Uh, it came around when I was already maybe 30. Gosh, I fought it. Man, I fought it hard. I resisted email. I resisted the cell phone. I resisted the beeper. You remember the beeper before the cell phone, Motorola? Remember that little junky device, that little beeper? Man, one of my bosses wanted me to get a beeper. I just look at him like, you must be kidding me. You are not beeping me at 11 p.m. There is no way that is happening, right? That's what I thought. And then one day, about two years after that, he said, look. He said, look, Tim, you have to get a cell phone. And I said, why is that, boss? And he said, because I have to be able to reach you 24 hours a day. I said, are you kidding me? Now, this is like 20 years ago, right? Almost. A little more, actually. Crazy, right? So I did not choose to live in the Internet age. Personally, I'd have prefer preferred to have been born in the 19th century in Germany because I love the music and literature of that time. I hope you'll forgive me. You can still be patriotic and appreciate Germany or Italy in the 1800s. But while I didn't choose the Internet age, I'm stuck in it now. And so are you. And whether we like it or not, listen to what I'm saying, please. Whether we like it or not, the Internet is now the primary vehicle for spreading the gospel. The Internet is now the primary vehicle for spreading the gospel and ministry of the word far and wide. The parable of the sower, how many of you remember that? The parable of the sower, if you, if you dig into it and think of it, in, in, in a certain way, by God's grace, you see a picture, a picture of amazing Jesus casting his seed far and wide. Jesus casts his seed in the parable of the sower far and wide, and he casts it indiscriminately. That seed is now cast through the internet. And believe me, there is some real seed going out. There is some real seed, some real high-grade seed going out. But the problem is there is also much that is going out that is not true seed or that is bad seed, if you want to call it that. 
now more than ever is the right time to concentrate on ministry of the word and to make no bones about it. Not just my words can affect a person, but your words can change lives too on the internet. Why? Because we're communicating Jesus. By grace, our ministry goes forth from the established church outwards. Our final point today is, in terms of clarity and focus, the most important. Please read with me. Point three, reaching upwards. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Ultimately, ministry is to focus on the Lord. It's by his grace. No one in ministry truly accomplishes anything on their own. If you're doing, brothers and sisters, when you're doing a ministry, you should never ever feel like you're accomplishing anything on your own. You should always feel like you're accomplishing things with God's help and with other people. No one doing true ministry ever accomplishes anything on their own, even Billy Graham, even Chuck Swindoll. No one in ministry truly accomplishes anything on their own. But true ministry is because of the Lord. And so we recognize him. We recognize the Lord. Someday, God is going to completely evaluate each one of us. Did you know that? Someday, your life is going to be evaluated by the Lord. Doesn't matter if you want it to be, it's going to be. Doesn't matter if you're not really a true believer in God, He's still going to take a good look at you. He's still going to evaluate. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Hebrews 9, King James Version, 17th century England. Also a good time and place to live in, 17th century England. I take it over this. Believe me, I would. But it is appointed to men once to die, then the judgment. God, not you or me, or even the entire civilized world will evaluate your life. Remember at the beginning, verse 12, those who compare themselves to others lack understanding. Now in verse 8, we see it's not people that evaluate you. At 18, I'm sorry. It's not people, but the Lord who approves, the Lord who commends. So so the scripture takes us from relativity to absolutism in Christ. God, not you or me or our neighbors or keeping up with the Joneses or what's on TV or some pop star or some movie star or some sports star, God will evaluate your life. Likewise, God, not you, not me, or even the whole society will evaluate your ministry. Don't let anyone's negativity, including mine, get you down. God sees what you're doing. God knows the truth of it. God knows your sincerity. As a kid, I love pancakes. Who loves pancakes? Come on, yes, that's the most hands I've seen in a while. I love pancakes. And I really love them if you, if you put the blueberries in them. 
And I really love them if you put the bananas in them. If you make a nice banana pancake and you just, you just grill it just right, right? So it, it, it all sticks together and the flavor of the banana comes out. And then you, you, you smother that banana pancake in butter. Not margarine, not country crock or something, but in butter. You smother it in butter and real maple, maple syrup. Yeah, then I love that pancake. And when I get a pancake like that, I don't worry about the taste of other people. You can like whatever you want. You put that pancake in front of me, I'm just thinking about that pancake. Whatever you got to order, fine, good, good for you. I don't care. I'm loving my pancake. Now, some people don't like pancakes. If you can believe it, there's even some people who don't like breakfast. But I love them. I love blueberry pancakes. Strawberry, waffles, oh, okay, but they're not like blueberry pancakes or banana. But anyway, all of these things, banana pancakes, strawberry waffles, they can all be good under the correct conditions overseen by the right master chef. Likewise, do not worry if somebody does not like your ministry, but likes the taste of their own ministry better. Don't worry about that. That's okay. You can still support them in their ministry, and you can still Look to God in your ministry because God is going to evaluate your ministry, not them. They're not the judge of it. God is. Your first aim is to please God. He is the one who truly approves and commends. But as we see here, be on guard against commending yourself as some in the Corinthian church are doing. Finally, Let's realize what true approval is, what true commendation is. True approval and true commendation is the Lord Jesus Christ. True approval and true commendation is the Lord Jesus Christ. You have right standing in him. None of our ministries stand at all without him. You have right standing with him. He is, his ministry infused into you and your ministry is the approval, is the commendation. It is the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on our behalf. He died for our sins and rose. It is about his ministry and our, ours, our ministry only as subsidiary. Someday the Lord may say to you, well done, good and faithful servant. Hearing this is what matters. The approval of God, the approval of the Lord, not the approval of man with their views to ratings, awards, and status. The approval of God, the approval of Christ, the approval of the Lord, that is what matters. So all of us, all of us, we need to regularly look at ourselves and see that our status and our identity is found in Christ. The whole thing, not some of it. It's not found in other people. It's not found in culture. It's not found in a a big paycheck. It's not found in having a better car than a neighbor. Your status and your identity is in Christ. Seek the Lord's approval in your ministry. Seek and ye shall find. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that your your burden and your yoke is light. And by walking in you, Every person here can succeed in ministry. But if we don't walk in you, Lord, it doesn't matter what what our talents, what our pride, 
what our thoughts, unless we walk in you, our ministry is not commendable. Because it is you, Lord, that approve. It is you that commend. It is you that evaluate. Lord, help us to look to you every day, no matter what plans we get in life, help us to look to you. We thank you, Lord, that you love us so much, that you love your church, your people. We ask you, Lord, for a blessing today to help us to reach further and further and further outside the doors of this church. We thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.